Uh, thank you very much. M uh, my name is John Hamry. I'm the president here at CSS, and I welcome all of you. Delighted that we can have this conversation. Uh, let me just make a couple of uh, general announcements. First of all, I, I do want to say thank you to our friends from Thin Mechanica who have made it possible for us to do this conference. Again, let me remind you, take your cell phone, pull it out, put silent, you know, silent stun, no, no bell tones. I don't want to listen to anybody's fancy bell tones here. Uh, we are tweeting live, and I'm saying this really for the audience that's outside, but I want you to know we're tweeting live, and it's at CSIS underscore org, and we're using as the, as the hash sign, it's hashtag GSF2012, and we invite people to dial in. Uh, we are going to be taking questions from all of you, and it's a small enough and more intimate enough room where we can do it directly, and so uh, I, I will simply you know, make sure that the that the conversation flows. But this is really your dialogue with uh, with both Mayo and with Brent. Uh, and then after the session, we will have lunch. You'll just have to pick up a brown bag as we go to the to the next place. Now we've had two people on Twitter who have already written us questions. <laughs> and the first question is, and we're going to cover these, gents. Uh, the first question is: After Fukushima disaster, does nuclear have a PR problem? I think we're probably going to talk about that. <laughs> and then the second question is, why does it matter if the U.S. is no longer a global nuclear leader in nuclear energy? That also is something we're going to talk about. So I want to thank our, our friends in cyberspace who actually framed this exceptionally well. I'm going to give a little bit of, a, of an introduction just to ground all of us. And I apologize to my two speakers because they really are the focus of this. But I think for all of us to have just a little bit of a point of reference. So let me go ahead and, and talk about what's, we're going to talk about the history of nuclear energy very briefly. We're going to talk about the nuclear energy production on a global basis. And then we're going to take a quick look at U.S. nuclear. So let's take a look at the history of nuclear. Now, of course, it started in 1942 when we were, when they built the Chicago pile. And of course, this in 1953, seminal time when President Eisenhower gave the Adams for Peace speech. If you think about it, it is still the policy framework for America. There's danger in nuclear, and there's great promise in nuclear. And we have to find a way to bring these together and to reconcile them and have a policy framework that makes that work. I would argue, and we'll go through this today, that that probably still is a, is a dominating landmark for all of us. So now as we go down, we see it was in 1957 when the Price-Anderson Act was passed. Now people, probably this audience knows Price-Anderson, you know, but most of Americans don't have a clue what Price-Anderson is. It is the foundation where we made it possible for nuclear energy because we established a government framework for liability. And I would argue it's one of the most powerful things that still shapes the effectiveness of this industry, something, frankly, that we've been trying to encourage Japan, they need a Price-Anderson Act. Okay, let's just march a little bit further in time. Uh, of course, back in 1968, we'll just give you a sense of where we were scale-wise, past the Non-Proliferation Treaty in 69. And then if you look at 1974, that's the last time we approved a power plant, 1974. It wasn't when we were building them, but it was the last time that one was approved, and the reason for that, of course, is we had Three Mile Island in 1979. Um, now, as we go down in time, now obviously that reshaped the landscape. Uh, we passed a number of pieces of legislation. 1985, INPO was created, very important. And INPO is the driving force of efficiency in American nuclear power production. And Mayo is the, is the head of INPO. Uh, INPO has an executive secretariat down in Atlanta, but they elect from among their midst uh, a senior leader. And, and Mayo is here, and he's here in that capacity that he's with us today. He's also the co-chair with Brent of our commission. Uh, you see, we hit the high water mark in 1990 for commercial nuclear power plants. We authorized Yucca, and I will show you soon we deauthorized Yucca. Uh, 2005, of course, is when we put in place this landscape for the so-called nuclear renaissance. And uh, very important, it's, uh, it's been a little bit slow on the uptake. Uh, we saw it, but in 2007 is when we started seeing new licenses being submitted. And of course, the NRC had in many ways sort of collapsed and had to be rebuilt. So that's been part of this process that's going on now. And then as we go down in time, Yucca was terminated. And then, of course, in 2011, Fukushima. Now, so we've, we've just got a brief review. Let me take a look quickly at the, 
at the global nuclear energy production. I think it's interesting to see this. And what I'm going to do is to show you, just to orient you on this, uh, the, the, the x-axis, the, the horizontal bar, this is the percent of nuclear inside these countries, and the y-axis is the amount of energy production in the country. And what I'm going to do is to track various parts around the globe to give you a sense of where, what production is like, and now you can see where we are. Okay, it's, uh, we're going to go out to about 2010 here and stop for a second. Um, this is, was the landscape pre-Fukushima, and you see uh, the, as a percent of nuclear, Europe was the largest, largely led by the French. Uh, the United States, you see, we're 20 percent. 20 percent of, uh, of our electricity production is coming from nuclear power in America. And what you see, you may have seen the Asia thing moving a little bit, and it, it, it went over, and it was closer to 14 percent, and by 2010 it's actually moved back, so it's about 8 percent. The reason for that is China has been building so much commercial non-nuclear plants. So it isn't that, 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 the, that, uh, that the percentage of nuclear, or it isn't that the raw numbers of nuclear plants have gone down, it's that the, capa the percentage in, against the economy has gone down. But now I want you to see what happens. We're going out into the future. Okay. You know, so we're 2030. If you will have noticed, Europe slipped to the left. And that reflects both Germany and Belgium and Switzerland saying they're not going to do nuclear anymore. They're, they're going to start phasing out of nuclear. <coughs> You see, the United States is still fairly static. It's drifted a little bit. It's closer to 19% by 2030. But you see this skyrocketing performance of Asia. And it's because you're seeing dramatic increases in the production of nuclear power in China. OK, let's, uh, let's uh, take a look at just the, the reactor fleets, just to give you a sense of this on a national basis. And if we're looking here, the, the y-axis is just simply numbers of reactors. And uh, the, 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 the x-axis doesn't mean anything. It's simply a way to spatially differentiate the countries. But just let, let's look at the pace of time of what's happening. Watch China's rise, Japan's decline. And this is in 2000. Now, we haven't seen anything yet happen for the United States, but now watch. And this is simply looking at retirement schedules for nuclear power plants. We only took it out to 2030. So now, uh, let me take a, a closer look now to the US nuclear energy production. This is, uh, these are demography charts we've taken from, from population economists, and we're showing, I'm going to show you the demography profile of the nuclear power fleet. And these are numbers of reactors in each column. So if you look at the, the light green, it's 25 to 29 reactors that are, are, uh, that are in, excuse me, in the age group, 25 years old to 29 years old. There are 30 reactors in that category. We're going to just watch to see what happens to our current, and this is by current investment plans. You don't see anything on the left. We're, we're getting out of the nuclear power business. Now, one last look at this. And this is, again, I'm looking at, at the numbers of reactors that we have, and again, the, the x-axis is meaningless because it simply differentiates so that we can show, and this is states, states in the United States, where we have nuclear reactors. We have roughly 104 nuclear reactors, and we're going to watch the clock. Georgia's going up a little bit because we still have production coming online. That is what we're looking at. Okay, so let's have a conversation. <laughs> let's have a conversation with. Uh, oh, I was going to. With uh, <laughs> Mayo Shattuck and Brent Scowcroft. Uh, they are kindly have agreed to co chair a commission that we're doing on the future of commercial nuclear energy. Uh, and so it's in that capacity I've asked them to come. Now, Mayo is, uh, is the executive chairman of Exelon. 
This is uh, a product of the recent merger of Exelon and Constellation Energy. He had been with Constellation Energy, and he's now the executive chairman of the combined firm. Exelon operates a quarter of all the nuclear reactors in America. Okay, so it's a, they are the powerhouse, as it were, of the nuclear power industry. Brent Scowcroft, everyone knows Brent, and I, I you know, Brent, I'm, if I were to really go through his resume, we would run out of time. <laughs> so uh, instead, let me say, I've asked him to be here not only because he's on this, uh, on our commission, but he recently headed up uh, a commission on behalf of the government looking at the fuel cycle. And, you know, we're going to shut down Yucca, what are we going to do? Big, you know, important question. So it, in that capacity, they both of them are deeply steeped and knowledgeable about this. And so let's explore what you've just seen. And Mayo, let me start with you. Um, uh, you know, America has this great blessing right now, and that is we're a, we're a North American island of cheap gas. It's, uh, when you think about it, it's a great thing for the, for the country. I mean, all of a sudden we have this abundant fuel supply at, yeah, but it's quite inexpensive, and it's really doing tremendous, it has tremendous impact on the nuclear power industry. So I'm, as a guy that has to make money every day selling power, what is cheap gas? And I don't mean that in a negative sense. Inexpensive gas. What is inexpensive gas doing to the future of nuclear? Well, John, let me start off by saying you have the coolest slides I think that I've ever seen. I'm going to, I'm thinking of how we might copy that. Now, I don't like anything about what they say, but I thought that they were very cool. Um, well, it's really interesting. I, I listened a little bit to the conversation in this room just uh, preceding this, and the ebullient, you know, excitement about natural gas was uh, prevalent and uh, its applications and its, uh, you know, uh, probably infinite uh, levels of uh, capacity and all these things that are very exciting on many dimensions. And I, I must admit, in being in a uh, highly regulated industry, it's, it's of some relief that our customers are in a period of time where they're benefiting from low natural gas prices, both on the, you know, the actual use of natural gas in their homes, but also from a uh, electricity standpoint, prices are way down, and customers really suffered dramatically during that commodity run-up that uh, coincided with the hurricanes, um, Katrina and, and Rita back in 05, uh, such that natural gas prices got up to close to $15 per um, MMBTU. You contrast that to today's price, which is a little bit over two, and each day we see it keep inching down to uh, levels that uh, are really somewhat unprecedented. So all sort of good news for uh, customers. We heard some things in the last session about what great news that is for uh, the application of natural gas, whether it's for um, you know, conversion to liquids or transportation industry or export. And, and all of those things, you know, I, I would agree, are great for America and great for the states. It is really not great for nuclear. And um, the reason being is that the price of power is, uh, in most regions in the country, uh, a function of where natural gas prices are. There are central clearing prices uh, that are really a function of the marginal uh, unit that's being turned on. So nuclear plants, which are intended to be running all the time, uh, it's very, very uh, expensive, awkward, and there are safety-related issues associated with every time you actually bring down a nuclear plant. So they're really not designed to be cycled, and uh, as a consequence, they're on all the time, and their marginal cost of operating is uh, pretty low, and therefore, they're at the bottom of the stack. Uh, coal is a little bit higher, uh, then you get into natural gas plants. So as natural gas, plant, natural gas has gone down, um, there has been a gradual switching of where those gas plants are on, are on this stack uh, to some degree displacing coal and getting t turned on before the coal plants get turned on. And that phenomenon uh, also affects the level of profitability of the nuclear plants because of this central clearing price notion. Um, so right now, it would not be unusual to look at the 104 plants out there today and see that some of them actually are not making any money at all. In fact, they're losing money. 
uh, particularly single units, smaller, older single units. And um, so even the existing fleet is feeling a little bit of the pressure in this kind of environment. The, um, the next question would be, well, is there therefore any price signal that would lead you to believe that you should build a new plant? And um, we'll probably get into this a little bit more, but when we examined uh, that ourselves, and this is during my constellation days, and uh, Joe Turnage is here, and some others, Mike Wallace, who's very involved in this commission with John, uh, really were leading the charge to examine whether, you know, in a new world, can we start rebuilding the fleet? And I think the conventional wisdom at the time was, number one, we needed carbon policy and probably carbon pricing in the neighborhood of $20. Uh, sort of added to the stack of, of a power cost. And we needed natural gas prices probably in the neighborhood of $7 per MMBTU. Mm -hmm. So when you think about the fact that we have no carbon policy and gas is at two, as you could imagine, you run through the economics and it's not a very good picture in creating the price signal for entities that are making not only decisions for assets that'll last 60 years, but for assets that take 10 years to generate any revenue. So um, what a lot of this is about is, um, you know, we're in a business of making very long-term decisions uh, and requiring price signals that are enduring. And since uh, the carbon debate has, you know, died on the vine recently, it will come back. Uh, and gas has gone through this massive paradigm shift. It does raise very serious questions about whether new nuclear um, can, um, particularly, particularly in the merchant market, and there are, there are some states that might be willing to, like Georgia, which might be willing to support new nuclear in order to have a more balanced footprint, um, but that requires the sovereign support of that state, which really means it's on the backs of the ratepayers, not the backs of the shareholders. And in a company like Exelon, uh, you know, we're making all of our decisions in the merchant world uh, as, as an investor. So I'll stop there and let you I think you've, you've shaped it. I think what, what, to summarize, you've said really there are no price signals that would lead us to build new nuclear in this country. And as long as natural gas is going to be as inexpensive as it is, that's, going to be, that's a long-term durable phenomena that we're going to have to deal with. So Brent, I come to the question that our friend in cyberspace asked, uh, which is, is there still a reason for America to be a nuclear power company, a country? Well, I think there is, but it depends on what your calculations are. You know, eventually, fossil fuel is going to run out. That's, that's a certainty. We don't know exactly when. We thought it was going to be earlier than it is with the new uh, gas extraction methods. The second thing is that energy demand in the world is going to grow, grow geometrically. Uh, we take it for granted, but much of the world is really not heavily dependent on energy now. As they modernize, as they get cars, TVs, electricity on, uh, lights on all the time, all of these things for the globe energy consumption is going to grow dramatically. Now, these two questions need to be answered. You know, how long can we depend on fossil fuel, and what happens after we can't depend on fossil fuel? Well, uh, the, the people who I run into who are dead against nuclear, and there's a psychological aversion to nuclear energy, uh, which I have discovered, say, well, we can use solar and we can use wind, and they're renewable and so on. Well, nothing I have seen indicates that the growing demand for energy can, without some revolutionary developments in solar energy, fill that gap. Nuclear is the only thing that we can count on that is, but it has these disagreeable features uh, which 
are salient in nuclear and not in the other. You know, you breathe polluted air, but you don't care about breathing polluted air very much because it, it only shows when you get lung cancer. Uh, but gee, nuclear stuff, Fukushima, look at all the people who died who were driven from their homes and so on and so forth. Uh, and, and Three Mile Island was one of the most significant events in our history because it really simply stopped the development of nuclear power in the United States. And so it, there are certain questions that need to be answered. And that is, what is the, how long can we subsist on natural gas? And when we fracked everything we can, then what? And we go from there. Well, you know, Brent, the only place where the wind blows 100% of the time is Washington. So, I mean, it, this is the only place you could substitute <laughs> nuclear for wind power. But let me, let, let me take you also wearing your national security hat. Um, you know, in going back to Eisenhower, I mean, he was trying to find a framework where we would manage the danger of nuclear power, uh, but we would still allow its promise for the world. Uh, uh, and what, but now we're in this period where, you know, look, America's going to shrink. I mean, it, it, just by being very conservative forecast, 20 years from now, we will we'll probably be down to 50 or 60 plants in America, and the rest of the world is going to build probably 200. So there'll be about 600 plants in the world, 10% of them in the U.S. And if you go out another 20 years, it's probably going to be 2% in the U.S. How does America shape the security environment if this trend continues? Tell, how do you think about that as former national security advisor? Well, I, I think about that a lot, and I didn't even go to the national security aspects of it, which I think are dominant in a way. We're going to have a nuclear world. Uh, we're not doing anything. But take Saudi Arabia, the homeland of petroleum, is building nuclear plants. 19. Most of the world is building nuclear plants now, rapidly. Uh, we're not. The national security aspect of nuclear weapons, or of nuclear energy, is also extremely important and is there a way that we can spread nuclear power for its benefits and control the resulting capability to go to nuclear weapons uh, which is a world we're trying to avoid right now uh, and that's a, that's a difficult question, especially if we are not in the nuclear power business. Then we lose all of our ability to control the development of nuclear energy around the world in a way which provides the benefits of nuclear energy without the detriment of weaponization. You know, if, if by 2050 we're down to two nuclear power plants, it's going to be hard to tell China with 150 how they ought to behave with the nuclear power. So I think exactly. what, what we have now, it seems to me, we've sketched out with, with both Mayo's comments and Brent's comments, it seems to me the, 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 the policy dilemma that we're facing. We, we, we firmly believe that, uh, that energy should be grounded in the private sector in America. But the private sector is not going to give price signals that let us build nuclear on an economic basis. Instead, it's the national security dimension we have to think about. But we don't know how to price national security in, and put it on top of customers. The only place we do it basically is in regulated utilities. And even then, it's not for national security reasons. So it seems to me that's the dilemma that we're currently wrestling with. Mayo, let me ask you, how did Fukushima change your world? I mean, 
it, both as wearing your INPO hat and, and wearing your Constellation and now Exelon hat? Well, it, cha it changed a lot, um, as you can imagine. Now, INPO uh, is the organization that uh, came out of Three Mile Island, and it was really designed to collectively uh, have a single self-regulatory body that uh, I think is best described as the body that makes sure that our weakest link is not so weak that its safety standards are compromised. And as a consequence, uh, a methodology was put together where we self-evaluate and in two-year cycles all the plants in the United States are actually examined by INPO and they're very you know, serious and detailed reports and they are reported out to a group of people that are all the chief executive officers in the industry. Um, and it, is, um, it has had an incredible um, bearing on, you know, over the last 30 years, on the overall safety of the nuclear plants in the United States. The, the best demonstrated practices are, you know, continuously um, uh, put in place to better each plant. When there's an event, the, the impacts of those events are, are turned into lessons learned and then disseminated throughout the industry. Uh, and this has um, had the added benefit, incidentally, of improving the efficiency or the capacity factor of these plants from what was back in the 60 percent. They were basically operating 60 percent of the time back in the Three Mile Isle day, uh, Island days and are now at 93 percent. So in addition to improving the overall safety of these plants, uh, their productivity has improved dramatically also, which um, actually on these bubble charts, you know, shows that the, the, if they were put in terms of the actual production, right. nuclear has in, improved its production not only from that effect, but also from up rates of the existing 104 plants. So they have become more important. Um, and so when, when Fukushima happened, um, the day one instinct of uh, IMPO uh, obviously was of, of great alarm. Um, for two reasons. One is uh, the desire to have an immediate understanding of what went wrong and what were the gaps associated between how the Japanese built their plants or what the designs were and us. And what, you know, what have their practices been over the last 30 years to improve the safety margin relative to what we did. So there were a lot of, um, um, you know, really detailed technical questions that needed to be understood. And I think surprisingly, um, this, there wasn't a blueprint for that that you could just look up on day one and say, oh, that was such and such a containment. Uh, this is exactly what, what happened. And therefore, we have two plants like that, and we need to go address those issues in those two plants. It was not that transparent at all. And in fact, it wasn't transparent until quite a detailed, you know, examination, a commission was put in place, a study of, of um, a large group of suppliers and vendors and, and operators in the United States could put together to try to help understand exactly what happened over there. Uh, and I'll come back to that in just one second. But the second, of course, immediate instinct was how do we make sure that um, uh, Washington and others don't, you know, don't go ballistic on day one with respect to uh, an assessment of this gap analysis. And so IMPO is um, not the advocacy arm of the industry, that is NEI. IMPO is all about safety and security and making sure these plants operate uh, well. Uh, but in conjunction with NEI, a very um, important uh, sort of uh, I should, I guess I could put it in the public relations dilemma of getting out into our communities, working with the NRC, working with the administration uh, to convey why 300 million Americans didn't need to panic on that day. And you'll all remember that in California they're buying their pills and, you know, local communities were getting stirred up. But I think that the, the industry did a very effective job getting on the airway. This was all pretty new to us. I mean, it's not like we have a PR arm that is ready to, uh, you know, drive out with, uh, uh, you know, a campaign on day one. But I think it was pretty well orchestrated that we needed to be present to counteract the hype that was going on with the media 
where the focus was all negative, you know, and this was, you know, what was happening in Japan. A lot of the information was very bad in those first few weeks, and the way in which it was being communicated, I mean, you just couldn't turn on CNN and, without seeing the image of the cooling tower, and uh, it, was, it was frightening uh, for many people. So we, um, we worked very hard at sort of mitigating the effects of that and making sure that our natural allies, like the NRC and the administration, were in fact supporting the industry. And we, you know, during the same period of time, could see that this was not happening very effectively in other countries as the politics in Germany quickly swung in the other direction and decided to shut down the whole thing. Um, but the important thing, you know, after day one was to make sure that we weren't, that there was some instinct, I think, that, that could have been bad, which was to throw the Japanese under the bus. Uh, and that is to say they do things a lot differently or their designs are different and so forth. And I think that the industry uh, immediately concluded that that was a very bad idea uh, because the principles of you know, how you run these plants and most of these designs are relatively common. Um, and so uh, we just, we need to understand the specifics. And what we learned over time was that it really wasn't the seismic event that, that caused the problem. It was the tsunami. Um, but the effects of the tsunami on the, the plant itself um, were, were very profound. And they led to certain conclusions around things like on-site power, you know, which is a key, key consideration for all of our plants throughout the world, about 440 of them. And the fact that that had been compromised was a severe problem. And we've been immediately ever since um, doing the reverse engineering to understand what we can do in the states to, to make sure that we don't have a similar like problem. The same is true with the venting and the containments or the evacuation plans and things of that sort that um, all came to light through these studies uh, we provided a lot of technical assistance, but we were uh, as eager to bring back all those lessons learned so that both the NRC and IMPO could put in place a plan of action of, of uh, investment in all of the U.S. plants to react to the things that we know were a result of the, uh, of the tsunami. Um, you, you may think that uh, the, the, the seismic issue was relevant there only with respect to what it created, but of course immediately led to a seismic um, uh, study, and it will be years of study, of reevaluation here on the, the seismic credentials of our plants. So even though it actually didn't have an effect on what happened there, it certainly is having repercussions uh, in, the, in the years ahead in terms of the evaluation of our plants. But um, I would say generally that uh, the industry reacted very well from a humanitarian standpoint, a technical assistance standpoint, and a lessons learned standpoint. And now we're in that phase of, of reinvestment, and it's going to cost us a lot, despite deteriorating mm -hmm. economics, to react to Fukushima. Um, and, um, but I think that the industry is going to be fine, and that is not true of another, of other more mature um, developed countries that, you know, have taken the political reaction and carried it through to, mm -hmm. you know, turning the plants down. And for, uh, for all the of you who do not know, you know, there's only one reactor still working in Japan. And because they are on 13-month refueling cycles, that plant presumably would now go down this month. They, they do not have an effective process to assess the restart uh, capability, and as a consequence, they are a little stymied, and, as, and, and we're going to see the repercussions this summer because they will definitely be short power, and they're going to have to figure out ways to uh, cycle and uh, go through blackouts and so forth. Um, the, I think the, um, the, the community at large there is very responsive to trying to help in this respect in terms of usage, but at the end of the day, it's going to be very hard to manage. Mm -hmm. And one, one last clarification is that you know no one has died there from radiological exposure. Um, there have been people who have died out of stress, heart attacks, you know, displacement, uh, in, in what was obviously a very tragic event. And some could be linked to 
uh, you know, the, uh, the stress of the situation within our own industry, but uh, the radiological release um, uh, still being evaluated. You read, read last week about the water release into the ocean. There, there's still a number of things that have to be much better understood, but, um, you know, so far we, you know, we didn't have the kind of accident like Chernobyl that, uh, that had, uh, you know, actual mortalities. Hmm. Let me just, so colleagues here have... Uh, Could I make I, just yes, one, please, one, one comment please, on, on Fukushima, uh, on the national security aspects of it. Uh, I was visiting Japan just a month before the earthquake, uh, visiting their nuclear facilities. I didn't go to Fukushima, not their power plants, but their reprocessing plants and their, their proposals for disposing of, uh, of nuclear waste. The Japanese that I spoke with were enthusiastic about nuclear power because it gave them back a measure of energy independence. They, they had run out, Japanese had run out of coal, so they're wholly dependent on imports of gas and oil for their energy. And nuclear was seen as a way to mitigate that dependency. And so this was a profound shock to them. Now, as uh, Mayo says, they have one plant operating. Uh, they can't start up the plants without the approval of the local regional governors, none of whom ha are prepared to give approval. This is not a courageous political situation. They can overrule it. But now Japan is faced with a fundamental national security problem. The prime minister announced shortly after Fukushima, we're getting out of the nuclear business. But now they're changing their minds because if they get out of the nuclear business, where do they get their energy? And they're facing the problem, which I outlined, which is down in the future for us. Germany's done the same thing. We're closing down our nuclear, well, but Germany is, is being duplicitous about it all. They're just going to use French nuclear energy to power their system. So the problem remains, and it's, it, and it's as Mayo says, it's very acute in Japan. Now, they're going to run out of energy this summer if they don't do something about it. And what can they do? Um, I think what... Uh, Two very important things I've heard come out of this, this, these interventions. One uh, is, as Brent just said, I mean, there's, there's a profound economic impact of why Japan needs to get back in the business, just because they can't afford to slow up their, their, their economy. The GDP is going to take a real hit if all of a sudden energy prices go up 20% because they have to import everything. Also, I would argue we need them to be back in the game as leaders in Asia thinking about things nuclear. Yeah, because they have been responsible states. This was a very tragic development, but they have been among the most responsible thinking about managing the security side of nuclear. Mayo made a very important point, and I don't know how many of you heard it, and that is that at the time of Three Mile Island, the efficiency of American nuclear power plants was only 60%. And in because of the reforms, largely because of INPO, the efficiency today is 93%. We have effectively built 20 nuclear reactors in this country simply by improving the efficiency of nuclear power. Now that was done by INPO. It wasn't done by the NRC. That was done by INPO. And just to, because I'm going to come to ask a question here. So did you understand why INPO is so important? Um, go back on that little moving chronology. You remember the Price-Anderson Act, 1957? Now Price-Anderson Act established the legal liability that the industry had to take on. They had to insure themselves for the first $3 billion worth of losses. Beyond that, the government would have stepped in. But the first $3 billion, each of the power companies had to pay for that. So they formed an insurance company, a mutual insurance company, so that they could then cover this, and then they have to pay premiums every year. Well, who decides the risk of individual plants and what their premium ought to be? It's INPO. So there's a, this dynamic. This is an exceptionally important organization. It's in the private sector, but it's an exceptionally important organization. And I guess, so I come to this 
Mayo, to share with us how the industry evaluates itself. Because, I mean, this is, you know, you, you have to decide, you know, if you run a shoddy, if somebody else runs a shoddy plant, you're going to be paying for it with higher premiums unless you can find a way to bring the industry up. How does that work inside it? Well, you know, John, it's, it's, it is uh, uniquely the most interesting culture that I've ever seen because uh, you have at the table, there are about 600 employees of Info, but you have at the table the, the guys and, and women that run the uh, nuclear plants in the United States. You've got the CEOs of every, of every company. And um, they've all endorsed the notion that we're going to evaluate each other. And so there's a very, very rigid process of every two years um, the plant, an info team goes to a plant and ends up rating these plants. And there's a rating system uh, that goes from excellent to needs to be shut down. Um, it's confidential, um, but it's very important, as you suggested, to the insurance coverage of each plant. You get a, you get a low number, your premium skyrockets, so there's a natural incentive to, uh, to do well. The industry is, is naturally very self-critical. And so um, if there is a hint of defensiveness or arrogance or whatever uh, in the response to an info evaluation, you know, the board of directors is going to hear about it. Um, so there is, uh, fortunately, a very high level and consistent respect for the info input at each, at each plant. And uh, one, one anecdote. Um, that I'll give you that gives you a flavor of this and it uh, it was a personal anecdote because I was brand new to the industry and I went to my first um, CEO conference the annual event and at that conference we spend two or three days together there's a private session where if you have one of these low rated plants you have to stand up in front of all your colleagues and in effect conduct a mea culpa and describe exactly everything that you're doing. These sometimes take an hour. Uh, and in the first one that I went to, uh, the, the CEO was brought to tears in this session, which gives you a, a sense of the emotional pressure that we apply to each other to make sure that everything that can be done to improve the operating safety of all 104 plants is being done and that we're going to help each other. This was an unusual concept for a guy <coughs> who's been an investment banker for 20 years and basically wanted to win, win, win to get into a culture where this wasn't about winning, this was about cooperating and helping each other and making sure that the weakest link didn't destroy us. And that's exactly uh, what happens when you probably, if there's an incident at davis Bessey as there was with a reactor head uh, a number of years ago. We, there, you know, the earthquake that hit the East Coast that affect the, uh, uh, the Santa Ana, the Dominion plant. Um, and fortunately, in an evaluation that was found not to, uh, to have affected the plant. But whenever something like this happens, we, we need to rally to understand what the lesson is from that so that we can react. And it's not you know, these, tech, these plants are constantly being rebuilt, incidentally. This isn't, these plants don't go up for 60 years and then get shut down. They're massive ongoing investment. You know, the uh, redo of a, a steam generator or a reactor head or, uh, you know, the, the reason that these plants can be relicensed is that the guts of them are actually constantly being rejuvenated. Um, and so a lot of money goes into maintaining them. But it is a, um, uh, it, it has become a very valuable and unique organization for our industry, and it's got a very low profile, uh, naturally, because uh, you know we're not in, in the business of, of uh, you know, frightening people about what is an incredibly important technology where we go about conducting our business. But I would say that Impo was uh, sought out after the Gulf crisis. Uh, to see whether our model might actually apply to offshore drilling. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was some very interesting testimony in front of Congress that went back over the history of INPO uh, to try to, in a way, 
create a little bit of a catalyst to see whether that industry could get together to talk about best demonstrated practices and hold themselves accountable to making sure that we didn't have a Gulf disaster. Um, that hasn't taken on a great uh, deal of legs, incidentally. Um, and I don't know whether that's the right answer or not, but it's certainly conceptually for something that had as devastating a consequence when something goes wrong as an offshore drilling, it's a pretty interesting thing and, and model to evaluate. My, my personal guess is that uh, it will take off, but that right now we're in this litigious environment where people are worried about, you know, getting too out in front of their lawyers and all that. It's going to take a little while probably for a set down. Yeah. But INPO is a, it, it's a remarkable success story, and it's uh, where the, the private sector shares the burden of governance for an important national asset. It's an important thing for people to know. Brent, last, my last question, then I'm going to turn to all of you. Uh, and that's you, I, I don't know how many commissions you've headed up, Brent, national commissions. I mean, uh, <laughs> hundreds probably. Uh, but the most recent one, uh, you and Lee Hamilton headed up the commission looking at what are we going to do about the fuel cycle post-closure Yucca Mountain. And uh, this course, hangs over this industry. It hangs over our Ameri popular understanding of nuclear. So d d just give us a thumbnail sketch. How serious is this problem? What, how do we solve this problem? Uh, you know, what kind of priority do we give to this problem? Well, it, it's a serious problem <coughs> with respect that uh, nuclear power plants, uh, nuclear energy, uh, produces waste. And after you have so burned the nuclear pellets, uh, incidentally, we use about 3% of the energy. And so there's about 97% of the energy left, but we take them out of the plants and then you have to dispose of them. Uh, and that's a problem. Uh, it's a problem that we've, we've spent 30 years on uh, because everybody understands it has to be put somewhere, but it's uh, not in my backyard, really. That phrase started on nuclear waste facilities. And that's what this commission is designed to do. Uh, for a long time, we, the, the government, uh, narrowed, narrowed the focus, narrowed the focus, and then decided that Yucca Mountain was the solution. Uh, well, uh, the Nevada government didn't like it. Uh, the, the counties in which Yucca Mountain exists wanted it, but the state didn't. So anyway, uh, the president said Yucca Mountain is dead. Uh, and set up this commission to look at alternatives. We do have nuclear waste that is waiting at decommissioned nuclear plants for storage. Uh, the nuclear utilities, or the utilities are paying the government for storage of nuclear waste, uh, and it isn't being stored. So this commission was set up to deal with that problem. And uh, that is what we're trying to do. To give you an idea of the scope of it, and, and, and incidentally, even, even if we revolutionize uh, nuclear power plants, even if we reprocess and so on, there still is going to be some nuclear waste that is highly radioactive material that has to be put away somewhere because we can't figure out how to get the energy out of it. Uh, but the, the, the nature of the problem, at least, in, and Mayo, maybe you can refine this, the nuclear waste that's been produced so far is about the size of a football field 20 feet deep. Now, you know, that's not an awful lot. But it has to be shielded, it has to be protected, and at least some people say it has to be protected for millions of years. Uh, well, we're actually looking. And in New Mexico, there are 
there are salt deposits that have remained unchanged for 300 million years. Uh, so there, there are ways to do it, but the problem is how do you make it acceptable to the people? And that's what this commission is trying to do. I, I was on the floor of the Senate, I was a staffer on the Senate when Senator, then Senator Chick Heck said, we're never going to let Nevada become the nuclear suppository for America. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure that was a Freudian slip, actually. I think it was, but, but anyway. But there's one, there's one place uh, in, in New Mexico, near the Carlsbad Caverns, called the uh, way, way, WIP, Waste Isolation, Isolation Pilot mm -hmm. Project. Uh, it has been enthusiastically embraced by the locals uh, in, in New Mexico and generally by the state itself. So mm -hmm. it can work. But, but Brent, I think to your point though, I mean it's, you know, this is not the mountainous problem that's made out in the popular press. I mean there's a, there's a no. nuclear facility, I, I think you own it, uh, about 20 miles from here. The, it's been operating for 25 years. The entire waste stream is stored on the equivalent of two tennis courts. I mean, this is not no, it, the it, giant it's not problem. It's a huge problem. It's a huge psychological problem. It's a psychological problem. problem. Because, uh, you know, in my commission, we, we had public hearings around the country. And one woman got up and she said, she said, radiation is the worst thing that's ever happened. It's responsible for obesity, for diabetes, for... You know, you go, uh, but it's that kind of fear uh, which is what you have to deal with. And I think the way to deal with it is to show that it can actually be attractive because near a nuclear waste facility, you could have a nuclear research laboratory hiring a lot of very intelligent people. What can we do with nuclear waste? How can we make it productive and fun? You know, so there you are just, ways to do it. You know, if, you, if, if you just visit Yucca Mountain, and uh, you know, which is a remarkable thing. You you feel like you're on the moon. It's uh, uh, there's no other place like it in the United States, I don't think. And it's a uh, it's of course where we practiced our bombing, and you know, earlier years. So it has some experience with uh, uh, the industry. But the Yucca Mountain's a you know is a geological repository, and there's a big you know five mile. Uh, hole with a train that goes down through it, and it's designed that you can take these titanium canisters that have the spent fuel in them and slot them into um, a, a spot where, in theory, they could be recovered 100 or 200 years later and used again. As um, uh, Brent said, you know, the, 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 there's still a lot of energy left in spent fuel, and the technologies might be available 100 years from now to reuse what is put in there. But if you uh, if you actually physically see the, the simplicity, not just in terms of how small the physical volumes actually are that we're talking about, but that you know, there are ways to, to care for, for this that are a lot smarter than having it sit on site at our, at our plants. Now, these are also safe, but sort of temporary mm -hmm. holding facilities. Um, and uh, it, it really has been a shame that we haven't been able to move this off the dime, it's you know very much about local politics. But it, from the standpoint of the science and safety of it, it's um, you know it really was quite a sound idea. Okay, I've taken too long, and I apologize to all of you. We've got about 15, 20 minutes. We can open up for conversation here. I, we do have microphones, I think, right? And what we do want you to use the microphone because we've got friends in cyberspace. So we'll start right over here, please. Yes, ma'am. My name is Peggy Evans. I'm with the Senate Intelligence Committee. And I've been um, reacting to the psychology issue that you all mentioned. One place in the United States where we haven't had that problem is with the US Navy. And in fact, the Navy has, um, in humanitarian instances, provided power from its vessels to uh, areas that uh, have suffered some sort of meteorological problem. Given that, how would you react to a proposal that echoes a decision made by President Kennedy to put a large trans, or to make, for government policy to make possible the 
um, implementation of large transmission lines uh, around both coasts, and then to use the technology that is uh, that exists in naval vessels to start on an offshore basis to start offering the opportunity to U.S. industry to invest in large transmission lines and then begin to implement other sorts of power beyond the carbon fuels, wind, wave, nuclear, using that technology that doesn't have the same emotional reaction that the large land-based power plants do. Well, uh, yeah, go ahead. Let, me, let me start while you're yeah. collecting your thoughts because, uh, you know, you talk about Navy nuclear power as if it's pristine. It has the same problems that other power. What do you think happens after when they decommission a ship? It goes out to Idaho. And, the, and Idaho has passed a law that in 30, by 2035, it all has to be gone. Where's it gonna go? So it doesn't, it doesn't solve the problems by taking it offshore and building the power plants offshore, if that's what you have in mind. It wasn't the story that I was referring to. Well, I know, but you have to do something with it. And the storage is the same problem, whether the plant's in Illinois or whether it's in a, uh, in a ship uh, sailing around the world. Hey, I'm not, I'm not the, the expert on this, but the, you know, there are, oddly enough, the same number of reactors in the Navy, 104 reactors as there are on the commercial side. And of course, they're a lot smaller. Um, and they require uh, and use much higher levels of enrichment. Um, and which is, uh, uh, and it would be against international standards, you know, because I've asked this question, why don't we just go to, you know, sort of higher power levels, you know, and, and uh, and but because of the international standards, it's, it would not be regarded as you know acceptable. Um, they are, of course, unbelievably expensive, right? When they're you know designed as such to be in a naval vessel, and so I think as a as a consequence, there's always something that's you know more efficient. Uh, and I you know it gets back to this issue of you know should there be nuclear capacity in the United States that you know, survives this generation of plants. And I, you know, of course, I'm a big advocate for nuclear and feel like the, the footprint, the generation footprint of 50 to 60 years from now has to have some nuclear. And for us to, in a business where it takes so long to build things, to just presume that natural gas is gonna be uh, the fuel choice forever is, you know, to me, a little naive. And all it would take between now and <coughs> 10 years from now is for there to be carbon policy implemented or you know, a terrorist uh, attack on a gas pipeline, um, you know, or something that happens to the cost deck in fracturing that you know, rapidly raise the cost of extraction from an environmental standpoint. I mean, so there are all these things that I, to me are, could easily occur in just in the next few years that would change the game again. So the big paradigm shift that we're all just assuming is like this endless windfall. Uh, I wouldn't. I wouldn't trust that as someone responsible for the reliability of the grid. And so I'm the the thing that makes me most nervous. And you know, I probably won't be alive. You know, on the day where uh, you know people wake up to the to the issue, which is that we can't be dependent on a single fuel type. And so if we are going to ignore the, the, the dialogue we're having today and just say, no, oh, what the heck, let's just, we'll, you know, we will keep putting up gas plants. There's no, in the near term, because that's what the price signals are telling us. But we have to deal with the policy issues because what I just described is a national security problem. You know, if we, if we got to the point in 20 years we were dependent on one fuel type and something radically changed and all of a sudden we've got an unstable grid and God knows what could happen to us. So the idea of having a mix is that we have to have policy considerations that keep in mind that we don't want the end game to be 100% of anything. And uh, you know, the intermittent uh, uh, energy sources like wind and solar, you know, we're very supportive of it and we're in the game and so forth, but 
you know, they can't be more than a certain percentage of our, of our total output. So um, I, I consider it not just a, uh, a national security problem as it relates to supporting our military establishment. You know, so there's one big issue, which is that our supply chain and vendors and so forth, we have gone from an, an era where 90% of all the stuff that went into our reactors came from the United States to it being just the opposite now. And so we've lost the supply chain game, which has an effect on the military establishment, which I think is, uh, you know, we don't have the people interested in nuclear, you know, coming through the schools, and we don't have, uh, you know, people building, you know, important components mm -hmm. to nuclear standards. So I think that that's a, I think that's a national security issue, and I think uh, bad decisions on the diversification of the generation footprint is a national security issue. And when you put those two things together, I conclude, you know what, we've got to figure out a way to keep nuclear in the game. And that's, that's you know, I think which is why this kind of dialogue is so important. Jim Holloway. Thank you, John. Uh, Jim Hoagland from the Washington Post. Uh, it was Fukushima that brought INPO to my attention, and what I've learned uh, has impressed me, and that extends to your remarks this morning. I wanted to ask you, in that spirit, about a reference you made to the fact that INPO can issue a notice saying this plant should be shut down immediately. Has that ever happened? If yes, can you describe how it was resolved? If no, what's the most dramatic notice of that kind that you're aware of, and how was it resolved? Well, that, you know, that is a complicated question, because when a plant is in uh, trouble, um, usually there's a decision made that's quite, quite simple to keep it offline. Uh, and that is a, um, usually a, a collection of decision makers that might involve, certainly would involve the NRC, would involve INPO, and would involve the company itself just thinking about, you know, in the natural course, what's safe. And so we certainly have a lot of plants that uh, over, I shouldn't say a lot, we have had some plants that over the course of time you would consider being of the, of the lowest rating, but they, they do, they're not on. And so right now, as an example, uh, the Fort Calhoun plant in um, Nebraska is offline because of those floods and the impact and assessment of the floods in Nebraska and the NRC and IMPO, or you know, we're trying to figure out how to get it back online. When it when it comes back online, it will soon thereafter get a rating, and one would hope that it would have a a rating of you know that's satisfactory. Uh, the San Onofre plant in Southern California um, uh, is offline. There are a lot of, lot of concerns about um, uh, understanding. Uh, once again, as always in the California plants, including Diablo Canyon, uh, the seismic seismic uh, impacts on those plants. But um, we've never had an instance that I'm aware of where we've had to um, force against the wishes of the company that a plant ha had to shut down because we felt that it was unsafe. I think they uh, were hopefully way in front of the game on that front since Three Mile Island where uh, you know we know long beforehand that this plant needs needs a long outage, needs to do X, Y, and Z, uh, and they react accordingly. So, I think just for the mechanism, because I think it's in, it, it, yeah, I'll, the mechanism. I think Jim is that the INPO rates for purposes of insurance uh, what the rating would be, and if they give it the lowest rating, the mutual insurance company, Neil, I think it is, yes. it, 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 uh, will not write the policy, and by law you can't operate a plant if you don't write the policy. So I think it really is a powerfully positive dynamic on how this works in this industry. We've got a question over here. And it, Dave, uh, did you uh, want to, I think maybe Dave, Dave want to have well, a... He's, can we just go over here, Dave, first? And then, here's, he's here's also a, a member of our commission. Please. And, and here's a real nuclear expert. David uh, Christian went to Minion, and uh, I just thought it's worth commenting and, and asking you to comment on this uh, waste problem issue in comparison, in, in two regards. One is, uh, the nuclear industry tracks its waste, which is very small and compact and solid in form, to the nearest gram, and we know where all of it is. And the cost of that is internalized already through the collection of fees from customers. 
uh, to the tune of you know somewhere around 15 billion dollars thus far. Uh, so the question is, if you use this scenario above, would the rough carbon equivalent result of this as an additional 400 million tons per year of carbon going into the atmosphere? So would you rather have a small compact waste form where you know where it all is and easily isolated and separated from the environment, uh, where the costs are already internalized, and uh, or would you rather have this other problem of 400 million tons of carbon going out where the costs are not internalized? And I'd like for you to maybe comment on that internalization of the waste form and, and uh, the trade-offs between those two. Well, I think uh, it's remarkable that we have ignored the costs to society of uh, our coal and oil-fired plants. Uh, and uh, well, we look at the sti statistics that result, but we don't internalize them as making any difference. And that's where I say there's a psychology about nuclear which, uh, uh, which doesn't flow out to the other energy producers. And it's probably because they've been around forever and they're just part of the environment. Uh, we did pass the Clean Air Act. Uh, and it helped a lot, but just because you can't see it doesn't mean it's not there. And, uh, but that's one of the psychological problems that we need to deal with, both making the nuclear, put it in its perspective as to how, how important it is and how it does or does not affect people and what it is we're replacing, not just because it's running out, but because it's a hazard to human health. You know, a lot of, uh, when, when the carbon debate was in full force, it, it appeared that most people thought that the electricity industry should reduce its contribution to carbon, which is significant, uh, by 80% over a certain period of time. And so we began to put together uh, forecasts of, well, how might you reach, you know, an 80% reduction in our carbon imprint, you know, obviously coal being the main uh, contributor to that being 50% of all um, generation in the states. And, um, you know, so you needed a lot of renewables and you definitely needed a lot of nuclear. And, the, you know, the one thing that always was um, the sticking point, as attractive as gas was, is that gas still has 50% of the carbon imp imprint as, as coal. So you can't, you can't put into that model anything that has lots and lots of gas, it ends up with the 80% reduction. So there is just a, there's a limit, and getting back to the generation mix issue, that um, yes, we should, we, we have not been good in America at pricing the externalities, the environmental externalities into the price of power, and as a consequence, you have uh, federal and state issues that are, that are complicated, that I think the EPA is trying to resolve through policy, but if you're a, Maryland generator as, uh, as we are, and you're working towards the Healthy Air Act standards in Maryland, which are the tightest in the nation, but West Virginia is not, and they're burning coal, and they're shipping their power into Maryland, which we're a 30% importer of power, mm -hmm. and we're getting all their air emissions mm -hmm. coming in our direction. So all of our own efforts, there's, that's an, uh, an economic uh, unfairness uh, issue that hasn't, this is why there's a sort of an interstate commerce related issue, um, but it, it, it's a small anecdote of why this business is, gets pretty complicated from a policy standpoint. Mm -hmm. And we have to keep in mind that, uh, you know, as Dave rightfully points out, the, the externalities of nuclear are actually, you know, have already been built into the pricing mm -hmm. We've raised $15 billion to, you know, build the Yucca Mountain and try to get to the solution, and potentially that will all go by the wayside. Uh, sir, I'm going to give you the benediction, because we're going to wrap up with the last question. Dave, Dave Garman with Decker Garman Sullivan uh, with a question for Mayo, really. Uh, we've outlined a scenario that I venture to guess that very few of us in the room uh, like, and it's dictated by... Uh, a failure to enact any kind of carbon pricing and, and low natural gas prices. 
I guess the question arises, is there an opportunity for something, you know, to change that outcome, to change that scenario with innovation, say, in small modular reactors, you know, factory fabricated, rail deployable, mass produced SMRs, that might change the business case. I, I did, you know. I yeah, I, I think that that's, that really is the great hope here, that particularly with SMRs, that, that um, you know, technology advances and that we, you know, we're able to figure out another way to, to use the science that's uh, efficient and effective. Uh, it's not there yet, and um, one of the key considerations in all that is not just uh, the production of the power, but there's a lot of infrastructure that goes around the plants, getting back to where, you know, this is another kind of security issue, <laughs> which is that you know, the protection of our plants is um, second to none in the world. You, know, you, right. you go to France and uh, visit a, a French reactor, and they have five security guards and rely on the local gendarmes for, for security. I don't know how long that will last. That I will say that I can't describe what it is on our front, but it's a lot different from that. And if you visit a nuclear plant, you'd uh, observe that. But the, the natural uh, security infrastructure required around anything nuclear is is vast in this, you know, and important in this country. So um, th this is where I get a little bit tricked up on the issue of the SMRs. Is that, you know, even if they're like Bill Gates wants to bury, you know, bury them, you know, underground, and they never to be re need to be refueled for 20 years, and then they just sort of die out. I mean, a lot of different notions in this respect. But at the end of the day. There's some infrastructure costs that don't go away, and um, but having said that, I you know I think that um, you know it's not an industry that's known for uh, you know technology innovations, you know rapidly changing things. I would say that obviously gas is the biggest paradigm shift in you know 50 years, just in terms of the efficiency of the extraction, and that is changing the game. So hopefully there'll be either another technology or a combination of technology and policy that lead us back to, again, the generation mix of the future that is well balanced and, and well thought out. Well, I, double thank yous here. First, I, I want to say thank you to Brent and Mayo for um, chairing this commission. We will have our commission report will be out in July. Uh, and uh, and the second thanks is of course for leading a fascinating discussion today. I, you know, our goal was to try to have Americans think about nuclear power. We don't think much about it, and the goal here was to try to put the dimension, the richness of this issue, in front of all of you, with the expectation that you're going to carry this conversation further. So, would you please thank these two men with your applause?